not after it. Yeah. The rest of my stuff is straight around here somewhere. I can leave that on there. Okay. Hey, hey, no, no, no. I work. No, they're the last to get out. Yeah. So they can not picture it going under. Hey, Bob, if you think it's wrong, can we uh, frame that our canoe tip over? Black or tied up? Um, pass this down. Oh, yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Martin Rembert, Rembert, and I'm on the Sepik River on our way to Hana Village. And I have with me today Dana. And Dana, please tell us a little bit about your uh, last days of boot camp, if you will. Well, they were pretty hectic because we still had some more film training, some film training to do, and trying to get everything ready to leave and packed up and everything moved and things like that. How long have you been traveling about? Do you know? Oh my goodness, we left last Tuesday and this is Saturday and somewhere in there we lost the day. So, or this is Friday or Saturday, so we've been traveling four or five days. Uh, explain something, you lost a day? Well, we crossed, the, we crossed the international date line about Wednesday, I think, and Tuesday or Wednesday and it kind of skipped half a day. So it's like real strange on you now. Um, you've been doing, uh, how have you mainly been getting around? How have you made it to... Uh, the Sepik River on your way to Hana Village. Well, we flew a lot. We spent many hours flying. I think it was, we added up, it was probably a day in fly, total flying time, but it was spread all out with a lot of layovers in between. And then we took, after we got to New Guinea, um, we took a, a truck for five, four or five hours over some really bumpy roads and out through the, through some jungle. It was really pretty. And then we got, we boarded up on the canoes and that's, where we are now on the canoes.
Exactly what are you doing here, Stacy? Oh, uh, we're carrying up a I-beam. What exactly is an I-beam? That big thing right there. <laughs> it's a, I don't know. How far are you carrying it? How far, guys? All the way up the hill. Half a mile. About half a mile. All right, that's cool. Thank you. Come back in line, Stacy. Who else around here? Heidi. And how do you feel today? Is it hot? Uh, slightly. Slightly? Uh, doesn't look slightly hot. You're sweating a bit much. Can you uh, explain this phenomenon? No, I cannot. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Heidi. Um, who are you? Rachel Kessler. Rachel Kessler. And how do you feel today? Hot. <laughs> yes. It was hard. Yeah, definitely. Really hard? Yeah. A lot of pressure. You look like you're really hot. I am, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Well, it was pretty hard work. It, obviously, it's pretty heavy and longer than the other ones we've taken up, but with God, you know, we can do anything, and that's a bit obvious today. <laughs> How far did you have to move it from the river up to here? How far is it? Oh, let's see. Pretty far. I, I'm not exactly sure what. I don't know, probably about four, 400, 400 yards. I have no idea. It's pretty far, I know that much. Do you feel it developed a lot of unity in, in the two teams working together, carrying the I-beam up here? I would say definitely, because the first day, I remember the first day we took one, one of the 20-footers up, it was, you know, we were real tired, you know, and got discouraged a lot because it was so heavy, you know. And now, now that we've done a couple, it's like, you know, we know what we're doing and stuff, and then the the second PNG team came in and out, and they're, it's like their first time too, and so we can help encourage them a lot. And so I think, yeah, it helps a lot to build a unity. What will the I-beams be used for? What's their purpose in the hospital building? They're the basic structure of the hospital building. They're coming up on the four corners, and across the top we'll have to lift a couple of them up to the top and bolt them on. So that's the basic structure of the building. It must be hard work working in the heat and the sun. Yeah, you get used to it though. We've been here for about two and a half weeks, and it's hot, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you get used to it after a while, you know, you just accept it for after a while. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Two of these were barely on when I took them off. Squad, Yolanda, squad. F Q U A D. Oh, no. Just people. Oh, no. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 
What is this flat spot of dirt here? It's the starting and the foundation for a hospital we're building. And uh, is there much of a need of a hospital around here? Yes, that's basic. You can tell from the people and all the diseases they have. It's well needed. What are these these holes here with uh, water in them? They're footers to support the steel beams. And uh, this is going to be a real big building, or is this like a little one? A big one. Okay. Um, what are we doing behind us here? Um, they're mixing concrete to put into the footer holes that haven't been filled. What we're looking at here is a group of nationals, and they've apparently burned this canoe. And the reason they do this is for waterproofing. The canoe starts out upright with logs underneath it and they build the fires underneath the canoe as they slowly burn the canoe. They don't torch it, they just scorch the outside and then they lay the bamboo on the inside of the canoe and burn the bamboo out of the inside. As they roll it over and as you see them now they scrape off the excess charcoal and this prevents a, a waterproof seal on the wood. It starts out very light wood and uh, as they finish it'll have a very nice dark gray tinge to it. Okay, Bobby, we're right here in Papua New Guinea, and there's a lot of work that's been going on here. Can you tell us just a little bit about it? Well, we're here to build a hospital in the Sepik River area. There's no hospital in this, no clinic or anything in this whole area. And uh, there's people that died even of childhood diseases. Three years ago, there were 47 people that died in this one village right here at Hana uh, just because there was no treatment and no treatment for any of the things that they have. There's no, not a nurse, not a clinic or anything in this whole area. So the idea was to build a hospital and uh, which is probably more of a glorified clinic and uh, the government has agreed to help send some people in and to help run the clinic if we would build it for the people in this area. What has been involved as far as coming to the point that we see here, the land's leveled out, uh, we have, looks like some heavy beams that are here uh, scattered around. What's involved as far as making this happen? It just didn't come together in just two days. What, what was involved in that? Well, first of all, it took one whole team uh, the year that they were here, or not a year, they weren't here a year, but the year they were here for the five weeks, it took them all of that time to get this to this point because we had to clear all of this brush off. They had to take all the trees. This whole area was covered with, with trees and stumps, and all of those had to be cut and taken off. And then all of this dug out, and it's all done by hand. And of course, it's very hot out here in the sun, and every bit of it wheeled and packed by hand uh, for this hospital. These beams have been carried by the kids in. It took, uh, we had two teams. We had probably uh, about uh, between 55 and 60 people on the beams and we carried them. These beams, these bigger beams that span the whole thing are 60 foot beams and they weigh about two tons. And we carried them by hand up here. So the next uh, trick is of course without any um, crane or anything of that nature is to try to put this all this steel up and that's what we're going to do tomorrow. They've got the um, foundations in, the bolts in. We've got these uh, huge beams here that weigh about a ton that we've got to stand upright. And we're trying to rig up something to stand those upright tomorrow. But if we can get this superstructure up, we will have the basis of a terrific hospital. And then we're going to lay blocks in between, concrete blocks, so there are no concrete blocks in this area, and so we have to make them. We shipped in a block machine from Australia, and the kids are making blocks, and then uh, we'll be laying the walls up out of blocks. Even the sand we have to go, as you know, uh, uh, several hours upriver to haul all the sand in here, and the uh, seamen has to take the two-day trip uh, up to get up here. So it's a complicated procedure to build something way up in here. And I think it's going to save a lot of lives in this area, especially children. The mothers are the ones that are especially interested in the maternity uh, part of it, you know, that there'll be a clinic 
for that because so many mothers die in childbirth and, and so many babies and children die. And uh, there's just not a lot of children here, not as many as there should be. And by building this clinic, it will save the lives. And of course, we're doing it in the name of Christ, and we feel that uh, when we uh, agreed with the government to build the hospital here. We told them that the first thing we want to build is a clinic, uh, or it's a, is a chapel, so that when the people come that we can share, and not us, but the people from Hana Village that are Christians now, that they can share Christ with all these people. And of course, when, when someone comes to the clinic, uh, half the family comes because they have to f provide their own food, they cook for them, stay here. So there'll be people from all up and down these uh, tributaries of the Sepik that'll be coming in here to this hospital and staying here. And of course, through that, then they'll be able to witness and, and win them to Jesus Christ. So that's the end result, is to witness and win people to Jesus Christ. And I think it's gonna have a great effect in this uh, area. Let's pick up in the front. One, One two, two, three. Two. Hold it. So they can set it on it. some pressure on, okay? We want to keep pulling. Not a whole lot. We're going to get caught up on these here. Okay, hold it right up. there. It's That's up. good. It's up. Okay, you guys pull. Okay? Hold it right there, okay? Yeah, <laughs> Well, what do you know?
people of Hauna and the church leaders, plus the Sunday school classes and the teachers, I welcome you all. Well, they're not really good luck terms, but they are is they're, they're, you wear them if somebody in your family dies, the whole family wears them because it means that they're, it shows that they're important. And I think they're, it's like a nut or a seed to, a, to some kind of tree that they just weave thread around and wear it as a necklace. Are you happy to be here in the game? Definitely. <laughs> I love it here. What do you love about it? The people, I think, and mostly. Pray ye therefore, Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Psalm 47 and 8. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy laws within my heart. down. Tilt down. Tilt down. Tilt down. Tilt down. <laughs> Cut the time, please. Who's got the time? Yeah. 
I'm here today with Mark Rigby on the PNG Hospital 2 team. Can Mark, can you tell me what you've been doing here today? Yes, as a matter of fact, I can. Uh, we've been shoveling gravel off of this, uh, this double canoe here, and we're putting it in wheelbarrows where we will carry it up this hill and uh, deposit it with sand and other various elements, mixing it together into a, uh, a concrete formation and pouring it into a hole, uh, holding together a beam uh, to which the wires are uh, connected that will extend across the river and, and form a bridge. That's just, of course, a very brief outline, but that's basically what we're doing. What's, what's the purpose of building a bridge here? Well, it makes it a lot easier to move across the river. See, every time someone needs to get across the river, you've got to have someone get into a canoe and it wobbles around a lot and people fall out and it's really messy. So we're building a bridge so that people can walk across without having to, you know, hail a canoe, as it were. Now, what's going to happen here? Let me, let me just explain this for a minute. Um, the canoe is going to come in, in this general direction. Uh, Brian is going to stand and, and guide the canoe in uh, verbally and pro um, possibly with, with various hand motions. Uh, someone will dive, uh, hopefully a flying leap, from the uh, stern of the canoe onto the uh, rolling log platform, uh, probably slipping a leg into the water first, just again, just for show. And then we'll be tying up the canoe, and they will be uh, deboarding, as it were. Uh, and going to their uh, respective lunch cafeteria. <laughs> See here, Bob looking over to make sure everyone is 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 safe and uh, and feeling well. I'm here with Bob Land, the head leader of the Papua New Guinea 2 team, and we're going to discuss a bit about this building behind us. Bob, tell me, what was the problem with this building? Well, the building wasn't very secure, for one thing, and the other thing is that it's right down here on the soccer field, and as you look out at the river here, we're almost equal with the river right now. The river, if it comes up another foot, would be under this building, and the, the river does rise that much. In fact, it comes up about three or four more foot in wet season. So it's not in the right place, and it wasn't very secure. It just uh, when we moved all of the things off of the airfield, they just kind of threw that building up temporarily because the team was leaving, and and they need a place to store the materials for the to the next year to the team came back.
You had an experience on this wall right here where you were hanging from the tree. Tell us a bit about that. Well, we were just trying to take the wall down. It was kind of uh, insecure, and so um, we kind of pushed it over, and we were holding on to the tree in case it did go, and it did go and left us swinging in the tree. <laughs> You had an experience last year, I recall, when you fell from the top of a wall. Can you compare the two? Well, it's a lot of fun. It has that, you know, let you down feeling. And uh, uh, this was, uh, gratefully, this time I got left hanging in the air. The other time I didn't, I came down with the wall. And actually, I was on, I'd walked the wall around and I had asked this one boy to study the wall. And he came over and studied the wall. He ran right into it. He was a big boy and he pushed it right out from under me. And I came down, hit on, fortunately hit on my head so it didn't hurt anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm here today with Heidi Rich of the South Pacific Film Team in this glorious day in Papua New Guinea. Heidi, can you tell us exactly what it is, is that is strapped around over your shoulders? It's a VO. It's a videotape recorder. What is a videotape recorder? It's like you put a videotape in and it records. Records what? things you see in people working in interviews. So you hook this up to your eyes and it records through your eyes? This no. Is a videotape recorder? No. There's a camera and this, see this cord here? Connects to the camera, that, and then the tape goes in here and then it records what the camera sees. So all you do is hold this over your shoulder? Is that the totality of your job is holding this VO on your shoulder? Yes, and I listen. See this dial right here? See the dial? Then I listen to sound through the headphones and I change the dial to make it so it's not too loud, not too quiet. What exactly is the purpose of all this that you're doing? Um, so that this team, PNG hospital team, will have a videotape to remember their summer. And you'll only be filming the PNG teams this summer? And Hawaii teams and Australia teams. I know that you have Bernie Bland as a cook. I mean, being that she's like... Bernie is the best cook. As I was going to say, I mean, being that she's been on every team since the beginning of Teen Missions, I guess she'd be a good cook. So what do you think of Bernie's cooking abilities? It is the best. I love her cook, her cooking. What has she made for you so far, and what type of meals? Bread, homemade bread for us, and um, pickles. <laughs> Bernie made pickles. I don't know who made them. We had pickles, and Chinese. Chinese, good, good. Well, what, about, what about the living conditions here in beautiful tropical Papua New Guinea? I, I understand the brochure said something about Olympic-sized swimming pools and showers and air conditioning. Is this true? Olympic size river water to swim in and um, wash yourself, wash your clothes. There are a lot of bugs here? Mosquitoes everywhere. Mosquitoes everywhere. How big are these mosquitoes? This big. That big. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that big. <laughs> Do you have any bug bites that, that we can show on film here? Oh, look at my elbows. My elbows are bad. Look at these elbows. Your elbow's bad. My elbows are horrible. See, look, oh, right there. Oh, look at his look, hat. Look, we have live captured on film. Look at it. It's look at it. It's filling up with blood. blood. Wait a minute. Watch. Hold the mic. Hold the mic. All right. Got it. Oh, dead. <laughs> That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Raid. The raid hand kills bugs dead. We must sign off now, ladies and gentlemen. The head person, Kathy, here said cut. So goodbye from glorious fun in the sun, Papua New Guinea. Excuse me, Kevin. What are you doing? Hey, excuse me. Uh, I'm watching the monitor right now. What is the monitor? The monitor is a little television set where we watch the shots that the camera person does. Is that all you do is watch, or what else do you do as monitor? No, I also uh, tell the camera person to pan left or pan right, to tilt up or down, whichever way he needs to move his camera to get the best shots, and I also look around the area to see if there's any other shots that he could be getting. Now, to those of us who are not that smart in uh, videoing, what does pan and tilt mean? Pan means um, a horizontal move from left to right or right to left, and a tilt is up and down. 
All right, Kip. Um, as monitor, are there any other responsibilities also? Well, I have to carry the monitor around with me and make sure the cords are plugged in and uh, be careful with it. Ah, um, cords, like what kind of cords? Are there several or just one or two or something? Uh, there is one cord that runs from the camera to the monitor. Oh, all right. And right now you're monitoring the camera? Yes, I am. Can I see a picture? Sure. Oh, yeah. That's me. All right. Yes, it is. <laughs> all right, Kevin. How do you like this uh, Papua New Guinea, Hana Village? I love it here. This is like a second home to me. This is my second time being here, and it gets better each time. Second time, huh? Um, what does uh, you as the film team person do here? Well, we're filming the Papua New Guinea 1 and 2 hospital teams. We're preparing a video for them to take home, as well as a documentary. Do you ever get chance to work with the uh, Papua New Guinea 1 and 2 teams? Yes, we've had the opportunity a couple times when, of our, when our, some of our equipment has been broken down, so we take the time off and help them out. Is there any specific piece that has broken down? Yes, the monitor has broken down. This piece of equipment right here? Yes, right here. How quaint. Um, where do you sleep, Kevin? We sleep in tents on the hill behind the church. Tents. Uh, where are your tents? On the, over there? Or yes, the tents are, our tents are across the river, and there's two people in a tent. Hi, this is Aaron Hood here with Catherine Gray on the South Pacific Film Team. Catherine, what is your job today for the film team? I'm liaison, and what I do is I write down basically what the shots are of, and I carry the tripod. And it's heavy. I don't like the tripod. <laughs> I, we carry it a long ways when we carry it. and. Um, up and down the mountains and set it up and then you balance it and everything and that's what I do today. Uh, what else do you, what else other jobs is there involved in this film team besides liaison? Well there's camera, uh, mic person, there's VO, there's monitor and then there's grips and the grips carry what everybody else can't and there's logger and uh, <laughs> they write down everything that happens, every shot and everything. With this, do we just have one camera? Just the one main video camera? Yeah, we have one camera. And um, if you want to get a different shot, you have to stop everything, move the camera to a different spot to get the different shot. That's why the liaison has to always be moving the tripod. So out of those jobs that you just listed, what, is your, what would you say is your favorite job? My favorite job jobs are being on monitor and on VO because you know what's going on and you hear the sound and everything and you can laugh at the jokes that people say and on VO you can see what's going on. I mean on monitor. <laughs> you can see what's going on and everything. Oh, 
proud of you. Thank you. It's three years old now. It's <laughs> taken it out. Oh, watch it. Name belong me, Kathy. Kathy? Name belong you. I didn't think it's this And here we have Aaron going across the river on a canoe for his first time.
Ja bin gewarnt, dass er die Tarnfehler wischt. Ja. Und der Schuhe ist, weil er ja wieder weggeht. Hey, wie du? Nicht, dass er nicht das Video geht. Du bist ja voll aus Wasser. 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 Bye-bye. <laughs> And so they created their own style of music using the bamboo to have the uh, drum beat and uh, guitars. And they tune their guitars differently than we do. So if you wanted to try to uh, play with them, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, so they started doing this and they have written hundreds and hundreds of Christian songs. And one of them that they played was one of the Christian songs. And the other two were just to welcome you and then to say also say goodbye to you. Question. Reading from the beginning of the verse. Then. 33. Then said I, Lo, I come. The volume of the book is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy laws within my heart. Psalms 47 and 8. Correct. Deceiving. One, three. Deceiving. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1.22. Romans 10.17. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1.22. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. <laughs> James 1.22. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Correct. Yeah. Woo!
Sit the gun over. school I wasn't really planning to go to college but I always had a strong desire ever since I was a little girl uh, to be a translator um, I came to know the Lord driving a tractor you know when I was about 10 or 12 years old out in the fields and I came from a very small country church about 35 members that's all but it was a very missionary minded church and um, uh, my pastor, after I was out of high school, uh, I drifted around a little bit. I mean, I wasn't a backslidden Christian. I just didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I had about 12 different jobs in about five years. And then finally my pastor kind of encouraged me to go on to college. And he kind of steered me to Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee. And that's a liberal arts Christian college. And I majored in history. <coughs> and uh, after I graduated from Bryan, then I taught, uh, I taught high school for five years, history and physical education. And while I was teaching, then I worked on my master's degree at Indiana University. So I had that background. And then the Lord led me to Wycliffe Bible Translators. And then from there on, I, I got all of my linguistic training at the University of Oklahoma under SIL. And then the Lord led me to Papua New Guinea. So that was kind of my background. So I really wasn't preparing to be a translator. Um, if, you're if you know that you really feel like, you know, you might like to be a translator, <coughs> then there are certain th things in college that you probably should take, like a course in Greek, because uh, we're translating the New Testament, and it's, it's, ha it's very helpful to know Greek. And if the, the university that you're going to, uh, if it has a, any linguistics, then take a linguistic course. Like Robin majored in linguistics, and she really didn't know that she was going with Wycliffe. She just, you know, how the Lord, it's interesting how the Lord steers us. And here she is with Wycliffe, which is the, our major work is with linguistics and Bible translation. Uh, anthropology, take as much anthropology as you can. But you should major in the thing that you really enjoy, you know, whether it's Bible or history or whatever. But if you're going to be a translator, uh, you know, you need to get that background. Of course, language, take a couple years of language. Um, how I was led to Papua New Guinea. I was led to Wycliffe through a brochure. And I never met a single Wycliffe person. I never heard a Wycliffe person speak until I got to University of Oklahoma and uh, took the linguistic course. Um, I didn't know what linguistics was all about. Then it was a very new science. Really didn't know what it was about. But uh, I wasn't afraid. I was just, I kept moving. And so I was telling my history class that last year of teaching, I was very interested in the South American cultures, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, all those South American countries. So I told my class, all my classes that year, I'm going to Mexico, pray for me. This is my last year of teaching. Now I don't know if you have ever told the Lord what you're going to do, where you're going to go, and how you're going to do it. Have you ever done that? And just say, Lord, bless me, I'm going to do this. Well, I'm kind of like that. You know, and you can get into trouble that way, but the Lord has ways of steering you and, and, you know, directing you. But I was telling everybody, my church, my class, my family, everyone, I'm going to Mexico. And so I was walking down the street uh, with my laundry bag over my shoulder, and I noticed that the gate to the football stadium was open just a bit. You know, just, it was just a jar, but it wasn't way open. Not too much activities going on in July in a football stadium. So I went in, not a soul around. It was just totally empty. And I thought, boy, this is great. Here I am, this huge stadium, 60,000 bleachers. So I went clear to the top bleacher and sat down and started to read my Bible and pray about Mexico. Mexico. I, I could hardly even say the word Papua New Guinea. I just didn't want to talk about Papua New Guinea and asked the Lord to give me peace about Mexico, about Mexico. And I was crying and just miserable. And after uh, 
a couple hours of reading my Bible and praying and crying, I uh, stretched out on the top bleacher, way at the top. And I went to sleep in the nice hot sun, thought I'd get a nice tan. And I woke up maybe an hour or so later, and I was hungry, thirsty. And I looked out across the street from way up there, and I could see a hamburger stand. I thought, well, I'll, I'll just come down there, go get myself a hamburger and Coke, and come back here and, and just be alone for a few more hours. I didn't feel like going back to the dorm. So I went down all the bleachers and went to go out the gate, and the gate was locked. Well, I got to, you know, through the night. There I was, this beautiful green football field on the 50-yard line with those 60,000 empty bleachers. And I fell to my knees, and I said, Lord, I will go anywhere. Anywhere you want me to go, just get me out of this place. And, of course, that's all the Lord wanted from me. And so they went and got the fire department to get a ladder. And they got the ladder and they got me out. And so when people ask me how I was led to Papua New Guinea, I tell them it was very simple. I got locked in the football stadium at the U University of Oklahoma. But you know that God never makes mistakes. And I says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for leading me to Hauna Village. I have never been sorry. I have never really been unhappy about that. God knows what he's doing. And for 20 years, I've enjoyed these people, I've enjoyed this work, and we're nearly finished. And I praise the Lord for leading me here. And so just be willing, just be obedient. God knows the very best place for you. Yeah!